Welcome, everyone. I, I thought maybe what we could do is, is get started with some introductions. So I'll go ahead and get started. My name is Lance Echo Hawk. Uh, I'm a member of the Pawnee Nation. My connection to uh, Deb and Ronnie, uh, Deb is my sister and Ronnie is our adopted sister. And I'll, I'll let, uh, when Ronnie gets here, Deb, I, I'll let you introduce her for her talk because there's a, a rich history between the two of you that goes back, I think, 15 years. So I think it would be good if you would introduce, introduce her. I would like to ask everyone to <clears throat> introduce themselves. And if, if you uh, wouldn't mind, say something about what your connection is to Deb and Ronnie. And maybe that'll help help us uh, understand why we're each here and what we might be hoping to get out of this. And I, I want to uh, welcome all the new visitors that we put a list of uh, some Nebraska people that Ronnie and Deb know, uh, allies of the Pawnee Nation in Nebraska. We want to welcome each of you. And uh, to hear a little bit, um, I think Ronnie's going to do the presentation, and then it would be nice to hear from each of you to know kind of what your story is in connection with uh, what Ronnie and Deb have been doing. So, uh, as I said, I'm Lance Echohawk. I'm here with my wife, uh, Barb. We have uh, three kids and 10 grandkids that are spread out around the country. We're calling in from uh, Vancouver, Washington. And there's people really all over the country, I think. Uh, and, and by the time everybody gets here, we might have it covered from uh, Pennsylvania to Hawaii. Our, our family's spread out. In fact, I just see, I saw a Hawaii sign on. <laughs> so uh, it has been helpful in the past to just kind of go down the list and ask uh, people to uh, introduce themselves. And so I will start down the list with Barb, my wife. <laughs> um, well, let's see. I think this is supposed to be short. I'll just say that I'm um, really looking forward to tonight. Um, I grew up in the Bohemian Hills and, and um, yeah, in Pawnee country. And I'm very interested to hear. Oh, God. Story. Forward to it. Thanks. Let's see. I'm, I'm going to go by my list, which may not be the order. <clears throat> Welcome, Ronnie. Uh, Hi. You are next on my list, but I will save you for last okay. uh, as far as the introductions go. So, Daniel, you're the next on my list. Hello, I'm Daniel Echohawk, and related to that, this uh, Deb or Echohawk family. On my dad's side, it's Alvin uh, Echo Hawk, and my grandma is, uh, or yeah, his mom, and my grandma is Charlotte uh, Spotted Horse Echo Hawk. That's how I'm related. Calling in from Albuquerque, and I'm here with my mom again. So, yeah. Oh, welcome, Aunt Marlene. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you, Daniel. BC, you're next. Thanks, Lance. So, yeah, I am actually Dan's sister, older sister. Um, my dad was Alvin Echohawk, my grandfather's George, and my grandmother was Charlotte Spotted Horse Chief Norman. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, Deb's my first cousin, as are uh, Lance and Roger and Walter. Um, our dads were brothers. Um, and, you know, I just want to say at the outset, because I might forget it, I don't know, I know Debbie knows this, uh, but we've had a lot of loss in the tribe. I mean, literally one person a day for the past three days, mm. uh, two to COVID and one to just uh, age and um, all elders. So kind of kind of sad here right now because I'm part of the service club so I get notified 
you know, and try to contribute, even though I'm far away, I'm in the Chicago area, uh, try to, you know, at least right now, I don't think we're serving, we're actually trying to offer monetary, uh, you know, support if we can. So I just hope maybe you'll keep the community in mind. I know you, I know folks always do, but uh, right now it's really uh, kind of sad around there right now. Thanks. Well, thank you, BC. I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, this is, this is a tough situation that we're in. I, I am aware that uh, COVID has gone rampant in Pawnee. The, the positivity rate for testing is, it's, it's pretty high. I can't remember what the number was, but yeah, it's definitely uh, made its way to Pawnee. Well, thank you for, for uh, letting us know that. Uh, welcome, Bill. You are next on the list. Yeah, I'm Bill from uh, Central City, Nebraska. I've been with the Pony Seed Project for the last uh, six, seven years. And I'm in Merritt County, uh, which is uh, Pony Nation uh, from years back before you were moved to Oklahoma. So I'm very familiar with the uh, the area where, you, where most of your ancestors were at one time or another. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you for joining the call. And we hope to hear more from you. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Daniel, Maureen, BC. Colleen. Colleen is next. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's good to be with you all. Thank you, Uncle Lance, for uh, getting us all set up. Um, Colleen Echohawk. I'm here with my husband, Matt. Echohawk Hayashi. Some of you know Matt. And my two kids are over here doing stuff. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, my dad is Howard Echohawk. Um, my grandpa is Witty. And my mom, uh, my grandma is Christabel Echohawk, but Christabel Morgan. Um, just glad to be here. And my connect, one of my uh, really good uh, memories um, is several, I mean, I don't know how many years ago now, but Andy Deb was um, out here in Washington. I live in Seattle, Washington. Um, and uh, we went out to meet her at, um, I think you were at some kind of conference or something, Andy Deb, and um, we were at the Tulalip Casino and you started telling us the story of um, the Pawnee Sea Project. And um, it was really a, an emotional time. I remember just having lots of tears in my eyes about, um, and, and just feeling so um, connected to your work. So it's a real honor to get to hear more tonight and hear from you folks out there in Nebraska and the, and the amazing work that you've done. So glad to be here and be with you all. Thank you, Colleen. Glad to see you on the call tonight. Uh, let's see, your sister Hillel is next. Deb, I'm gonna, I'm, you're on my list next, but I'm gonna skip you uh, and have you introduce Ronnie, yourself and Ronnie uh, at the end here. Um, no, yeah, my name is Hillel Echohawk. Um, Colleen is my, and um, yeah, our father is Howard Echohawk and <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, like Colleen just said, our our <laughs> our um, grandfather is witty, and um, I'm super excited to be here. Um, I'm currently quarantining. Um, I just got back from Massachusetts for a a, a two month stay for the I Collective, um, and so I'm quarantining to keep you know do the whole thing. Um, but I'm here back, at, <clears throat> back in Seattle. Um, yeah, I'm super excited that this is happening. I love hearing about the Pawnee Sea Preservation Project. I tell everybody about it all the time, whenever I can. Um, so yeah, this, this, is, this is awesome. Well, welcome to the call. I, I know that the work that you do ties directly to the work that uh, Deb and Ronnie do. So we'd like to hear more about that as we go. Uh, let's see. Hello. So Gina is next. Hello. Hey, Gina. How are you guys doing? We're good. Well, good. Well, I'm uh, Gina Francis, and I am Deb Echohawk's daughter. 
and born in Boulder, Colorado. I live in Pawnee, Oklahoma right now. And I've been mom's helper since day one, I guess. So <laughs> I kind of consider myself a corn expert and it's, it's interesting. So I'm, I'm really, it's nice to learn about all the varieties and you start seeing all the characteristics and the over time how the seeds get better. So good to see everyone. Thanks for being on the call. Gina, you're everybody's helper. <clears throat> <laughs> Whether you want to be or not sometimes, huh? And let's see, one one more introduction. Dominic. You want to introduce yourself? My nephew's here. He wanted to introduce himself, but he's not up here, I guess. So thank you. I know he's floating around somewhere. Yeah. Uh, next is Jerry. Yeah. Am I on? Yeah, we can hear you now. I'm Jerry Carlson and Nancy, my wife's with me, and we we live in Genoa. Um, born and raised, and we've been with the basically the Pawnee Seed Preservation since close to the beginning of it. We actually raised some uh, native seeds before that, before we were invited to be Pawnee Gardeners. Um, we're both uh, spend quite a bit of time with the Juneau Indian School. Nancy's been on the board, and basically she. <laughs> Started clear from back when we formed a uh, um, foundation, and so we do a lot of work there. We we've spent a lot of summers um, we helping guide um, quite a few Pawnee with when they come out to Genoa or through Nance County. We are familiar with almost all the landowners through the county, and so we've. We probably, you know, we help people through that want to see some of the open sites. Um, and I guess when we started, we it was kind of fun. We were able to, I know I, I worked in agronomy for my uh, uh, whole career. And we I knew the owners, that, that the landowners that had the property, that have the property now that the Pawnee ladies planted their corn in when they were still in Genoa. So we were able to actually plant some of the Pawnee seeds in the fields that the Pawnee ladies used. So it's it's been it's been fun. And I hope some of the seeds that we planted here helped the uh, project. Um, do you, Nancy have anything? No, nope, she doesn't. She usually does the talking. That's why I'm stuttering through this. Okay. Well, Nancy's not cooperating tonight then. <laughs> well, she set this up and got it running and it's so. Oh, well, that's good. That's I'm not good on computers. <laughs> well, I love what uh, you and Nancy do up there and the respectful way that you do it. And uh, very much appreciate you guys uh, being on the call. I, I know when, uh, <laughs> Not quite sure how how it happens, but I do remember the time uh, Barb and I were traveling through, stopped at Genoa to stay in the city park in our RV, <clears throat> and uh, here comes Nancy. And I it was the first time I ever uh, knew her or, or uh, met her, but she has some wonderful information for Barb and I about some things to check out in Pawnee country as we drove through it. It was just, it was very, uh, very nice. I appreciate that. And years later, uh, I had the chance to go back to, uh, to the area with uh, Walter and Roger <clears throat> and Rob Bozell was, was guiding us. And uh, one of the stops we made was at your place. And uh, I just really deeply appreciate uh, what you do with the, uh, the burial site there and how you respectfully manage that. So thank you both very much for that. Uh, let's see, we're down to, well, it says Linda, but it's uh, usually Roger and Linda, so. 
square looks a little empty. Roger, are, are you and Linda there? Yes. I'm Roger Echowahawk, and I'm here with uh, my wife, Linda. And Lance is uh, one of my older brothers, and Deb is my older sister. And as you can see, Linda and I, we live in an underwater cave is somewhere in Colorado. <laughs> and is it a yellow submarine or? <laughs> well, I'm really excited to be here tonight. Uh, so greetings to all the family. And uh, I'm really interested in hearing from all of our friends from Nebraska. So thanks to everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you. Okay, well, we're going down the list for those that are newcomers to what we're doing. We're introducing ourselves. Um, let us know where you're calling in from and uh, what your connection might be to uh, Ronnie and Deb and all the work they've been doing. We have a bunch of uh, Nebraska, I'm honored to say Nebraska um, allies on the call with us tonight. So I'm really looking forward to this. So we've got uh, uh, Linda, Linda S. Well, 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 Linda, we'll come back to you, uh, give you a chance to uh, unmute your mic and introduce yourself if you'd like to do that. Uh, please uh, please uh, do that if you feel free to. Uh, Liz, Liz is on the list next. Hi, family. Um, it's good to see you all. I'm here with my mom, Yvonne Echohawk. She's visiting and has made it safely from Alaska after being stuck there from COVID for months and months and months. Hi, um, that, my mom. And yeah, I'm the daughter of Yvonne and Howard Echohawk and um, the siblings to Colleen and Halal and many other siblings that aren't here tonight. And um, I'm calling from the big island of Hawaii um middle of our winter it's probably 72 outside and um it's good to see all your faces and hear your voices and i'm really excited to listen to aunt deb tonight so thanks for being here doing this well, thank you for calling in tonight we always appreciate appreciate it when you can make it um <clears throat> uh linda you're you're still up next but uh uh, let me know. You, you can let me know you're ready by unmuting your mic. I can see when that happens. Um, let's see. I'll send her a text. Okay. I'll send her a text and see what's happening. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Lucille. Good evening, everyone. Lucille Echo Hawk. Um, uh, number two child of Ernest and Jane Echo Hawk. Um, my Pawnee grandfather was Elmer and uh, my grandmother was Alice Jake Echo Hawk. But the grandmother I remember most is uh, uh, Lucille Shunatona Echo Hawk, uh, who uh, helped raise my father and his siblings. And uh, I um, uh, have a daughter uh, Jewel Marie Little Soldier, who uh, passed away in 2001. And uh, this is a kind of a sad month for our family, uh, uh, having lost uh, a brother this month in 1982, and then my daughter in 2001. But, um, but we soldier on and remember them well. Um, uh, I don't know a lot about the seed project. So I'm definitely an, uh, a learner and uh, want to extend greetings to the folks from Nebraska that have joined us this evening. Looking forward to Ronnie's presentation. And I'm particularly pleased to, to meet the, uh, is it Carlson uh, family uh, at Genoa? I remember when my brother Larry was um, doing his political thing, he was invited by Frank Lemire to speak to the state Democratic Party in Lincoln, Nebraska. And he agreed to do so with one condition and that was 
that Frank Lemire would take him to Genoa. And uh, he said it was one of the most moving experiences he ever had and uh, encouraged others of us to, uh, uh, to take that journey. And I hope to do that one day. So I'll look you up when I do. So good to be with you all tonight. Thank you, Lucille. You won't regret it when you look them up. Uh, so let's see, we have uh, Nancy Schnell. Good evening. I'm uh, so honored to be invited to join your meeting. I am a friend of Sherry Echohawk. And three years ago, I was a teacher in a large school district in St. Louis County. We were having a celebration for our 100 acre nature center. And I had contacted Washington University to ask for a speaker. And they sent Sherry Echohawk and she gave the most beautiful land acknowledgement to open up our ceremony. And uh, I became very interested in the Pawnee Nation and Sherry has invited me. I was to, uh, went to Pawnee Powwow two years ago and then a great honor, I was able to come and pick corn uh, last year in Nebraska. And uh, it's just, I've been reading Walter Eckerhawk's Sea of Grass and I just find your family extraordinary. And it's a great honor for me to listen to your story. So thank you. Welcome and thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, Sherry, Sherry D. Hi there. Hi. I'm Sherry Dukes Ideas and I have my husband Marlon here with me. Um, we are Pawnee growers. I'll give him, there he is. Um, we live uh, in the village of Amherst, Northwest Buffalo County, Nebraska. We live approximately 15 miles from Kearney and a few miles from the Wood River. Uh, we are gardeners and um, we've been told whether or not this is true or not, you know, sometimes people tell stories that the area where we live was an area where the Pawnee gardened. I don't know if it's true or not. We do know that um, people through the years have found pottery pieces and so on. But uh, we've gardened for, I don't know, four or five years, maybe. We also have beehives. So my husband is a beekeeper and uh, we enjoy the Pawnee. We really have met a lot of wonderful people. We've taken uh, our pickup or vehicle down to Pawnee, Oklahoma with some of the, uh, uh, with some of the things we've grown. And uh, we, we just really enjoy doing this. Well, welcome. We, we are uh, very appreciative of what you do, in, uh, including the bees. If, if I understand things right, the plants need the bees. Absolutely, they do. And Ronnie will ask me to take photos periodically for crop reports. And sometimes um, I've gotten stung as I'm <laughs> taking photos. You have to be careful. <laughs> welcome. Get out of there. Get out of there. Uh, did your husband have, any, have anything he wanted to say, add? Want to say anything, Mom? No, they taking our corn to the university. They had DNA testing done on it. That was last year. Ronnie can probably fill you in on more details, but some of the corn we grew uh, went to Lincoln to be tested. All right. Well, thank you for being on the call tonight. <laughs> That brings us to Sherry. Good evening. Thank you for uh, joining us here on our family Zoom meeting. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing the stories from our Nebraska folks and uh, appreciating them taking their time to be with us tonight. And um, uh, sorry to hear about our, our elders in Pawnee. Anyway, glad to be here and uh, hope we have a great evening. Thank you. You're welcome, Sherry. Thank you. Uh, I'm not skipping anybody on purpose, but every time someone talks, my list shuffles. So 
I'm trying to keep track of that. I'm going to jump back up the list to Anna. Hello, everyone. It's so good to see and hear all of you here. Um, so I'm Anna Echohawk Souter. Uh, Lance Echohawk is my dad. Barb Echohawk is my mom. Um, so Aunt Deb, um, my, my brother's sister, and Ronnie have been my gardening inspiration. And I've been growing um, Pawnee Blue Speckle Corn where I live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania for the last two years. So I'm really looking forward to seeing all of you this evening on this call and hearing hearing from you. So thank you for joining us. Good to see you. And um, I'm glad you're here. To, and maybe you can talk maybe more about the, the PA extension of this whole venture. Yeah. And, and maybe brag a little bit about the massive crop you've had this year. <laughs> I think some of these Nebraska gardeners have me have me beat on that front for sure. <laughs> Looks like Linda, are you unmuted? And... Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Linda Schleicher. Schleicher. Yes. Hello, from Kearney, Nebraska. I'm uh, Ronnie's sister, her older sister. <laughs> She'll be glad to tell you that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm just glad I had, nice to see so many faces I'm familiar with. Um, you know, I've just been helping Rhonda where I can. It's been great to meet so many people and do what I can to help out. I help a lot with Roger up at Mason City, so. Just good to see everybody and hear, hear what's going to be going on. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Uh -huh. Th thank you. And uh, John, John Echohawk. Uh, John, let me know if you, if you uh, get unmuted. We'd like to hear your introduction. Um, I'm going to assume there's a technical difficulty. <clears throat> so uh, thank you, everyone. Oh, did Nito? OK. Uh, got a newcomer, Nito. Uh, Nito, what we're doing is just introducing ourselves, uh, thing where we're calling in from, and uh, what, what connection you have to Deb and Ronnie. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm Juanita Nakoni. I'm uh, Owen and June's daughter, the second oldest one. And I have my husband, Don, here with me. Uh, we're not connected to anyone. For anything. I'm just here to learn and get what I can. But it's good that everyone has come. And well, that's welcome. all. Welcome, Nito. Don, did you want to say anything? No. Uh, okay. <laughs> that's good. I'm good. All right. Uh, a 303 number just came up. Okay. We got a new phone caller, code 303. Uh, what we're doing, we're just at the tail end of introducing ourselves. So if you'd like to unmute and introduce yourself, we're uh, sharing who we are, how we're uh, where we're calling in from and what our connection might be to uh, Deb and Ronnie. Oh, that, yeah, I think. Go that, ahead, John. That's John's phone number. Am I connected now, Lance? Oh, there you go. You Thanks. Are. Thanks. I'm John Echohawk, uh, third, uh, third family member from the Jane and Ernest Echo Hawk family raised out in New Mexico. I got a phone call coming in. <laughs> Sorry about that. All my uncles have passed away, so I'm the oldest uh, male member in our family. I'm a lawyer and executive director of the Native American Rights Fund in Boulder, Colorado or the National Indian Legal Defense Fund, and I've been at it 50 years. We're uh, really pleased to have our uh, uh, friends and allies from our uh, Aboriginal lands uh, 
in uh, Nebraska with us uh, this evening and look forward to hearing from them. All right. Well, thank you, John. Uh, did we catch everyone? I think we caught everyone but Deb and Ronnie. If that's not the case, please, uh, please let me know. And I'm sure there'll be some time for uh, some talking and sharing after the presentation, because <clears throat> we do want to hear uh, uh, more from everyone. So Deb, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself and then just turn this over to, to you and Ronnie. Hi. Hi, Deb. Uh, I, I'm so happy that everybody's on board tonight to listen to some good storytelling. Um, Ronnie's the best storyteller I know. Uh, and maybe I'm just partial, but um, I, I'm i just uh, really pleased with um, having her do what she's about to do tonight. And, and that's uh, uh, to talk about the O'Brien stories. Um, that's, um, Ronnie's been uh, really close to um, the seeds and uh, has been awesome and working with our gardeners and um, I, I really uh, enjoy all the monthly reports that we get and uh, all the sharing um, that the gardeners are in part a lot of their own stories and um, you know growing is, is hard work and they have stuck with it um, and there just can't be enough said about that. Um, that's something that we are uh, trying to foster that we always, now that we have our seeds back, that we um, will never lose them and that one day it'll uh, be able to feed our, our local community and then some. Um, and none of this could have, would have happened really. Uh, I'm pretty confident to say um, without all that beautiful work that um, these gardeners have provided. And um, it's, it's kind of interesting to, to think about, uh, you know, why we're, we are still, you know, growing in Nebraska. Um, once in a while, I'm confronted with the question of, of are we going to keep growing in Nebraska? And uh, uh, so I, I'd like to illustrate very briefly why we will always grow in Nebraska, I hope. Um, this is a shadow box and we filled it with um, some dirt. And on this side, uh, it's you can tell it's a little darker. Um, and this is from Dale Fikes land. And on the other side is where Ronnie grows her garden. Well, right in the middle that bright red, uh, depiction it's not a depiction of Mars but but it could be um, but that's our Oklahoma soil that, that's red clay and that is this soil depiction alone is kind of tells that the soil is so different and we know that in the 17 years that we've been growing in Nebraska and Oklahoma that our plants always do better in Nebraska. Um, I'd like to describe that sometime as, as just simply calling it uh, soil memory. 
Um, and you, you know yourselves that when you look at a package of seeds, it'll tell you what climate, what region the seeds grow best uh, in. And uh, that's pretty much uh, like our, our Pawnee corn. Um, it just does well. Um, and, you know, Oklahoma does a, a, a real purpose. At least we can weaken the seed down here so that it will it'll shout out uh, some new varieties perhaps. And then we can take those new varieties up to Nebraska and grow them out proper. So we've really been blessed with uh, having the uh, 16 varieties of our corn. And so at one point when Annie and I moved to Oklahoma and we were asking everybody, you know, where's our Pawnee seeds at? And we can only come up with three. Um, and since then, you know, families have contributed, bundles have contributed, um, you know, just we've we've been able to to find our seeds, and the mother corn has also brought back varieties that we had difficulty uh, in obtaining. Um, so I know I'm talking a whole lot about corn, but honestly, when Ronnie and I, you know, we talk every day. Um, this is kind of, I mean, that this is what we've talked about. You know, we talk about the detail. Of, of our corn and and how, how what it's doing and how it's doing um, and so she's my uh, personal think tank and um, I've been real proud to uh, call her my my little corn sister um, so I hope you enjoy the stories tonight and uh, uh, with that, uh, just turn the floor over to Ronnie. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, sister. You know, I, I was thinking how intimidated I was going to be with all the Echo Hawk family here, and now I'm twice as intimidated with all of these amazing gardeners uh, on, this, on this talk. Uh, they really are our family and uh, gardening is, a, uh, farming gardening is a lot of work and a lot of stress, especially these ancient varieties, and, and it's just amazing to have them here. So, uh, I could, we could do another whole night on more of that, honestly, um, or two or three, <laughs> but uh, tonight I've been asked to talk about how I got interested in this and where it all began uh, and the O'Brien stories, my husband, I was, he's not coming. My husband, I was hoping my husband would sneak out here and say hello, but he's so shy. I don't think I'm going to get him to do it tonight, but I've told my husband forever that I married him for his family history because it's so good. <laughs> uh, and that goes back to the O'Briens that were very near to where we live. We're, we're nine miles from where they were originally uh, coming back to this area. Uh, they think the O'Briens had left this area of Nebraska, but we've come back. So um, I think to understand the friendship of Edmund O'Brien, my husband's great, great grandfather to the Pawnee chief that he was friends with uh, here in the middle of what is now Nebraska. Uh, I have to go back to Ireland and uh, Edmund O'Brien was 18 years old the day that he fled Ireland because the English were after him. He was a Fenian, a rebel against English rule and their oppression of the English and uh, fled from his confirmation in the church and got on a ship and came to the United States and never went back to Ireland uh, running for his life and understood oppression, understood they having to be educated in hiding uh, because they weren't supposed to be educated. So he came to this country in 1842 and helped build two railroads on the East Coast. Uh, he was a teamster and he worked with mules building the grading for railroads. Uh, so he 
he was a huge muscular, he wasn't very tall, uh, but he was a very muscular uh, and tough person. And met his wife, Ellen Collins there. Uh, she immigrated from Ireland also. And they went to Iowa first uh, and in Iowa City, Iowa, and then decided to come to Nebraska because some of their cousins were coming out here as freighters to Fort Kearney. And they saw this spot that they thought looked like Ireland. So the whole family, cousins, sisters, Ellen O'Brien, Ellen O'Brien was one of three sisters that moved. Uh, they all came and they settled along the Wood River and it became known as the Wood River Settlement. And uh, it was also along the California Mormon Trail there was a lot going on in the 1860s uh, when they came in 1861. So the, the trails were coming through. Uh, there was no railroad yet uh, and they needed a way to survive. They squatted, uh, that's just, you know, that's what the O'Briens did, uh, squatted on some Pawnee land. And in the spring of 1861 and that fall, was the first time that the Pawnee chief, who they came to know as Many Blankets, came out with his hunting party, uh, about three dozen people, and camped right next to where the O'Briens uh, squatted, literally right next to them. And that was where they had been coming out to hunt for uh, years. And the buffalo were getting more scarce, so the hunting along the Wood River, which was a good place to hunt, became even more important when they came out into this area. So um, it's 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 just the way it was. All of the settlers uh, settlers they would uh, as, as we call them were afraid of what they called Indians, uh, and. Ellen O'Brien was no different. She was she was very afraid. And Edmund, you know, this really story this story is really about Edmund more than anything. And Edmund just became friends immediately with this uh, Pawnee chief, Many Blankets, that, that he called Many Blankets. Uh, and one of the first things the chief did for him, being a teamster, Edmund was very good at breaking animals, mules, horses. Uh, that was his expertise. But he didn't have any out here, and um, many blankets did, and he needed things. And Edmund had was able to trade with people coming down the trail to get things that he would need, and maybe, uh, and I'm assuming this maybe could help many blankets out because they were such good friends. And uh, many blankets taught Edmund how to break horses using the waters of the Wood River and the mud in the Wood River in the summertime because it dries up in the summer, some summers, it's just a runoff river. Uh, and then he had horses to trade for supplies from people coming down the trails because there was no other source, no other resources for supplies. Uh, so every time he would come out, uh, the, the two would uh, communicate. So I don't know how they communicated. I, I, I cannot, I, I have no idea. Uh, how they communicated. If they were interpreters within the mini blankets group, I just, I don't know. Somehow they figured out how to help each other out. And these are stories coming from my husband's grandpa, O'Brien, Don O'Brien, who lived to be almost a hundred, um, just a few, just very short, just shy of a hundred when he passed away. And he lived, uh, he grew up in North Platte for the most part, but he also came to the Wood River area and lived with his grandparents in the summer. And uh, his grandpa died, Edmund, uh, died when uh, Don O'Brien, my husband's grandpa, was 14. And his wife, Ellen, didn't die until grandpa was 24. So, I mean, he knew them and he lived with them in the summers. So uh, he heard a lot from them and he was interested. I think he was interested. So it was asking questions. And there's another granddaughter that wrote uh, a book that we have about the O'Briens and the Pawnee. Uh, so there are plenty of stories to put together about uh, what happened. Of course, they're all told with an Irish flair. Uh, so Edmund bought a plow 
took his ox and duke and dutch and started to plow some land uh, that first year and then got some of the Indian ponies uh, to, to trade that fall after he got some from the chief. And uh, they started, they, they made that first winter. I mean, if you can make it through your first winter, your chances of making it got a lot better. So they made it through their first winter here. They had enough food by that winter with their gardening and, and crops to make it. Of course, they were growing crops, corn from the east that they brought from the east. Um, so they made it through their first few years. They came in 61 and then came six, uh, 64, 1864. In February of 1864, a, a supply wagon came down the trail and the O'Briens were on the edge of the settlement. They were the first ones to see any wagons coming and behind it were a couple of other wagons of people going to the Salt Lake Valley following the Mormon trail. And Ellen and her sisters were, were very good at, uh, they, they weren't doctors, but they were very good at curing a lot of things. So uh, Ellen went out to greet the wagon and came running back with a little boy that was sick. And she took him in and put him on a, a buffalo blanket in front of the fireplace and sent them down to her sister's house to spend the night. And from that little boy, um, her sister Mary's little boy got sick a week later and died a few weeks later. And then the old, uh, Edmund and Ellen had four little boys and three of their four little boys died from the same fever, uh, which they got word from a hundred miles away was diphtheria. And while the third little boy that was a year and a half old was dying, they took the three-year-old and stuck him outside in February in a gunny sack hammock. I don't know if you have any three-year-olds around, uh, but I don't know how you'd keep a three-year-old in a gunny sack hammock outside in the middle of winter in Nebraska. Uh, but according to Grandpa O'Brien, uh, many blankets came to hunt with his people and many blankets came and took the little three-year-old over to his encampment until the last little boy died and the O'Briens were able to scald everything and, and uh, burn everything and bury the other three little boys in their wagon. That was the only wood they had to bury them in. Them in. And then uh, many blankets brought uh, Dennis back, the three-year-old. And Dennis is my husband's great-grandfather. Uh, so Ellen, who was skeptical and afraid changed drastically uh, toward many blankets because of what he did for their remaining child. And when he would come out after that, she would, he loved her bread. She would bake three loaves of bread together in the same pan, uh, leavened bread, and he loved her bread. So when they would come out here to hunt, she would bake bread for him and Edmund would take it over to him. So uh, she, so it was something that she could do for him. Um, so she did that for years. Um, and then came August of 64. And if you are familiar, I'm sure Roger is familiar. If you're familiar with uh, August of 1864 in Nebraska, in this area, um, that was what this, the settlers called the, the big, in, the Sioux Indian scare was what, what, it was what it was called. And that was when they started retaliating uh, in Colorado, Julesburg, and then started backward down the trail, cutting telegraph lines, uh, burning stage stations and things. And word came down the trail that this was happening so all of the women of the area fled and only the men stayed and Ellen was, Edwin put her on a stage with Dennis, the only one left and they went clear back to Iowa. Uh, one woman stayed and that was Mary, uh, Ellen's sister and uh, the one that lost the first boy. She refused to leave so she stayed and took care of her sisters and everybody else's gardens. We can all imagine that all of us in Nebraska, oh man, 
you know, we don't have to ride our Shetland ponies over to somebody else's garden to, or, you know, our ponies that are going to run back home like hers did, uh, to try to take care of everybody else's gardens. So she, uh, she took care of the gardens until everybody felt it, it was safe enough to come back. Uh, and the interesting thing about that is, is um, a traveling photographer came through at, during that time. And Edmund had never had a picture taken of himself. And Mary was at the house working on Ellen's garden. So he asked her to impose as Ellen and not tell the photographer so that they, they had their picture taken together, Edmund and his sister-in-law, because it was his chance to get a picture taken of himself. So we have that picture of uh, from 1864 during, uh, during those times. And yeah, he needed a haircut, let me tell you. Uh, so, Everything was sa safe enough to come back. Ellen uh, came back and uh, everything settled down at that point. And of course, Minnie Lakes just keeps coming out and hunting. And 1866 was when the Union Pacific built through this area. And Edmund helped uh, go out to the Grand Island in the middle of the Platte River where there were uh, cottonwood trees big enough to make ties from and helped build his fourth railroad in the United States as the Union Pacific uh, came through. Uh, and they had more children after that. Uh, they had a, a, a boy that died in 1869 in January and Ellen blamed it on the only Buffalo blanket she didn't burn, that he got the same fever that she thought the boys had had and he died. But then in October of 1869, the same year, they had another little boy, James O'Brien. And at the time uh, he was born, Ellen had been in labor all night in October. And they, they had a little log cabin at that time and it had just a little window in it because glass was so hard to get. And it was morning hours and Ellen had been up all night long. She was in labor, she baked bread while she was up. And the sun was coming up, it was getting light out and all of a sudden the, the cabin went dark. And Edmund looked and against the window, the small window outside were three Pawnee faces smashed against the window. So he went to the door and somehow they let him know that many blankets needed Ellen because his wife was having a baby. And Edmund's, no, Ellen can't come. Ellen just had a baby. No, we need Ellen. You know, we need Ellen's help. She must come. No. Nope, Ellen's not going anywhere. Uh, she can't help you today. So uh, she wasn't able to go. But later that day, Ed, Edmund went over and he took three loaves of bread that Ellen had baked uh, to Chief Many Blankets. And Many Blankets gave Edmund a blanket as a gift for their new son. And these two little boys were born a half mile apart from each other on the same day. Uh, in October of 1869, and uh, they, those two little boys became like brothers. Uh, whenever they came out, they played all, you know, they did everything together whenever Manny Blankus was out here. And he actually called him uh, his, his Indian birthday brother, is what he, he called, referred to uh, that little boy as. So in, eight, in 1874, the grasshoppers came and destroyed everybody's crops and everybody's everything and, and, uh, and ate little Dennis's shoes and left only the buckles and, and ate all the leaves off the trees and uh, just destroyed everything. So, and I know that really devastated the Pawnee that year also. Um, we've talked about that before. Uh, so it was a sad time for the O'Briens when, um, they knew the Pawnee were gone and uh, they didn't know where they were going and, or if they would ever see them again. And of course they never did and never heard anything about what happened to them. So uh, I, I heard these stories from Grandpa O'Brien so many times uh, over 11 years uh, when I was trying to interview him about the railroad side of the family because my husband is generation five and our son is generation six uh, for the Union Pacific Railroad. Um, 
And I was trying to get that written down, but grandpa just kept going back to, to the Pawnee. So there was the mindset among the O'Briens that he, he made sure I understood that, that, uh, you know, most people didn't, didn't want anything to do with anyone uh, it, that was Mormon. And if you were the, a friend of the Mormons, you were pretty much outcast from everybody else. Uh, and the O'Briens were. And, and grandpa said, we always will be. And, and he said, uh, you know, a lot of people didn't care for any, 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 any natives, uh, but the O'Briens did, and we always will. Uh, and, you know, and he said that pretty matter of factly, uh, you know, uh, so, but he didn't have to convince me. So when I was at the archway and decided it was time to start a program about native uh, people. I decided that we were in the heart of Pawnee territory and, and um, that that would be the logical tribe to, to reach out to. And it was an opportunity for me as an O'Brien to try to reach out to the Pawnee and Gosh, there were several reasons, you know, uh, just to rebuild some type of a friendship, if it was even possible. You know, you know, it's strange because when I grew up and, and Linda can vouch for this, my sister, my dad, our, our dad talked about Indians a lot. <laughs> and it's funny because he's from Palmer, north of Palmer. And uh, he never mentioned the name of a tribe. And I'm sure the reason he didn't is because there was really only one there. And that was the Pawnee. Where in other areas you'd have to talk about what this tribe did, what that tribe did, where really that was really Pawnee um, country. So he never really mentioned the, the tribe. And to tell you the truth, I didn't realize I grew up very close. I, I, I grew up close to Palmer. Uh, I had no idea I was growing up where the Pawnee were. And I, unfortunately, a lot of us are like that today. Um, so it was it was was with with bated breath really that I made the phone call to Oklahoma. I didn't even know where the Pawnee were, you know, uh, or, or why they were there. I, I knew and I knew nothing uh, for a long time. And rap started talking, and I started reading books, and then I started figuring things out. But uh, so that first phone call to me was so huge, and and, and I just thought, what if nobody wants to talk to me? What if I? What if I don't get anywhere with this? Uh, this this is the this is the one. Sh I finally had a reason. You know, I felt like I had really good reason to call and try to do something. So, uh, you know, that's how I got started with this. And and uh, and then of course I had to get Deb Echohawk on the other side of the line, which uh, within an hour was amazing and truly. I felt blessed that, um, you know, I, I was so excited when I hung up because she had asked me if she could get her cultural committee to agree to send some corn up here because I, I was, I'd been looking in catalogs for corn seed catalogs all over the place. There really wasn't online yet at that time. And uh, so, and I, by reading, I knew that the Pawnee had a lot of varieties of corn. I grew up on a corn farm figured I could grow corn again if I really uh, wanted to teach about the Pawnee. Uh, but I had no idea that it was that endangered. And I, I just have to be honest. I would, I, I think when I hung up, I after I thought about it, first of all, I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. She's going to try to send some corn up here. And then I was like, oh my goodness, there's hardly any left. What did I just, what did I just say I might do? What if I fail? Oh, if it doesn't work. Uh, so there was a, a lot of uh, responsibility immediately with, with uh, what I was maybe going to be doing. Uh, but I also thought it's 2003. What are the chances that a tribe would not have brought their corn back by now. And what are the chances that if they hadn't done that, there would be any left at all by 2003? 
And this whole time since we have started this project and all of these other amazing gardeners have joined us. And, and I mean, they're amazing and their knowledge is just incredible in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, what have, we, what have we gotten into here and uh, how do, I mean, I grew up on a corn farm, but that was that yellow stuff that came from the East Coast somewhere way back when, and that's all I knew anything about. And uh, uh, I was pretty scared, <laughs> uh, pretty scared, um, especially if, if, it, if it didn't work. And, uh, and I was the one that made it not work, but uh, I think the, the biggest miracle of all, really miracle of all to me was that the Pawnee kept this corn viable in land where corn doesn't grow well, isn't supposed to grow. For that many generations and that many decades, somehow they kept varieties viable enough because they didn't trade it, right? They didn't give it to anyone, which is how it got to the point it was but talk about determination to keep something going. Because corn, you know, if you listen to the experts, corn should not germinate after five or 10 years. It simply isn't going to grow anymore. Well, you should have seen somehow those seeds we first got. And a Pawnee corn is not like the ordinary corn. It's very extraordinary. So uh, to start with where we were and to have great gardeners with wonderful knowledge. And I've leaned on them along the way uh, also to, um, to learn. I mean, we, we've all learned, I think we've all been learning from each other uh, and there's been a lot of learning going on. There still is a tremendous amount of learning with this project. So that's the O'Brien story uh, that has, been handed down to us through the family. Uh, and it, it, it really has been wonderful to be able to, I, I, I just, I wish Grandpa O'Brien was still alive. If Grandpa O'Brien who told these stories over and over and over could just know, uh, and you know, uh, that today that the O'Briens are working with the Pawnee, uh, uh, I just, I don't know, I don't know, he, I, I don't know what he'd do. Uh, it would just be so wonderful if he could know that. And of course, the first thing I, my first question I had, does, does anybody in Oklahoma know what happened to Chief Many Blankets? Uh, did he make it to Oklahoma? Is there a record of him? Is he known? And really, I'm not, I've not been able to discover him. Um, the Frigio family, the brothers, said that they had a their ancestor had a friend in Nebraska, a, a chief in Nebraska, that was a very good friend whose name was Many Trophies, and he wondered if that might be the same thing because the blankets would have probably been pelts. Uh, he was a hunting, you know, he was a hunter, but I don't know, uh, and I have no idea. So, uh, so anyway. That's the O'Brien story and, and what made me get um, me want to make that phone call and start a relationship with the Pawnee uh, and, to, and to really bring back. I, I really wanted the Pawnee to help it, if we put on a program for fourth grade, which is the Nebraska history age in, at the archway where I was in Nebraska. Uh, a program about the Pawnee, I wanted to be told by the Pawnee. I wanted them to help put that program together if they would, instead of what somebody wrote that was some white person, the white man hundred years ago, uh, because that's what a lot of the writings are. I, I wanted it to be true Pawnee. Uh, so I had a couple of, two or three really good reasons to call and, uh, my goodness, after an hour, I was pretty blown away um, with, with what Deb was willing to at least try to do. So, 
that's my story. And we had a lot of other Nebraska people on here. So uh, it would be wonderful to hear from some of our other gardeners, because I know they probably have similar type, maybe not as many stories, but certainly thoughts, uh, you know, about what made you get started with this? What made you want to do this? Thank you, Ronnie, for sharing that. Uh, I'm gonna assume that you're uh, ready for some people to make some comments. Um, yes. Let me just invite everyone and anyone <clears throat> to add to that story. That's a, that's a very rich story with a, a lot to think about and talk about. Uh, and I'm sure there's, there's uh, people with something they can add to that. Well, I will speak. I am Sherry Dook's Ideas, the wife of Marlin. We are the, uh, the corn growers or, or the Pawnee uh, growers that live in Northwest Buffalo County. And I'm also a student of history. I'm a historian. So I come upon this with a lot of historic interest. And I guess when I introduced us, I forgot to say that both my husband and I come from rich agricultural backgrounds in Nebraska many generations of farming and i've always had this idea and i can't prove anything but as we've grown for the pawnee we've had hail wind tornadoes and everything comes back seemingly and someone told me and i don't remember who it was someone we met when we went down to the pawnee nation that, that perhaps the reason why we have pretty good luck is because the land where we grow our corn is blessed. And I gave that a lot of thought and I was wondering, is it possible that it could have been blessed by the Pawnee in Nebraska or is it just simply a coincidence? I don't know. I just know that we have good success. And uh, it's almost to the point where it's like, there's something, there's something beyond my knowledge and beyond my experience that is working for us. Because we've had corn that was literally nubbed almost down to the ground from hail and it came back. And it just amazes me, you know, whereas the field corn around us might be destroyed, our Pawnee corn came back. Does anyone have any thoughts? That's a good question. Thanks for posing that. Deb, you want to take that one? Oh, Sherry. <laughs> um, you know, part of our project, we have uh, a seed blesser and it's it's a elder woman and that um that will do that honor and um with our nisharo council uh they have a role too um they uh will delegate or maybe one of the chiefs will take on um a part of the blessing that we do on our, our seeds. Um, and actually, you know, I always say that our, our, uh, our seed, um, hold on, I gotta get up and walk around. Okay. Um, What I what I like to say is 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 that our um, the seed project itself um, we we like to say that it started with a prayer um, and and that was uh, you know through Nora Pratt um, and her hour long prayer 
um, that talked about in Nebraska and and uh, the quality of the seeds and and what she remembered um, about it and you know longed for the taste of it and uh, what have you and you know it to me that that's what started our whole seed project in the first place was prayer um, and that that prayer um, but we've 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 since Nora Pratt have always had a seed blesser and then um, uh, and working with the Rickeraws we uh, um, have learned a lot from them on um, connecting with the our ceremonies and the woman's side of the plants and the um, so with with that um, there's been a lot of spirituality a lot of prayer um, and you've met me Kai um, that's uh, an intern that that went up there very spiritual young lady, um, you know, always singing to the corn, always praying, and uh, and that's 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 part of, I think, part of the blessing that um, when we were starting to grow down here, you know, we'd have Marlene Mamiya and um, just uh, uh, different elders that would just come out to the gardens and just pray. And, and so I can't begin to tell you how many prayers go into um, to all these seeds. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll have uh, the, the man's part of the ceremony is, you know, it's real discreet and it's kind of like cedaring. Um, but they um, they take their time, you know. They make sure all the seeds are 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 blessed. Uh, so I that that's a, a kind of a long answer as to why did they do so well. Um, and and then too, um, I I know I talked to you Sherry one time about uh, hail and. Um, you know, how um, different tribes have regarded uh, that there's power in the hail. And, um, uh, but, you know, that um, even my own daughter was um, in part of a healing ceremony for her. She, she had to eat some hail. Um, but um, uh, so it's it's not um, surprise. It wasn't surprising to me that you know that corn came back. In fact, um, I always felt like your corn that year that it got hailed down to the nubs and came back. I felt like um, from that turmoil um that it was created you know when 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 hail was made up above and then hail down you know i always felt like um you know that it's uh that was that's probably some special corn you know something to um to hope that when our elders eat it or when someone is uh having a toiled life themselves that that uh it, it would help them. Uh, but, you know, those are my opinions and, and uh, um, my beliefs on that. Anyone else want to share some ideas? You know, you're welcome to. Deb, I was going to say this is Sherry. Thank you. I'm, I've almost come to the conclusion it's something that we can't explain for whatever reason. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry and Deb. So does anyone want to add something? This is Deb again. 
Uh, if no one wants to add anything, I would like to put Ronnie back on the spot <laughs> and um, uh, talk about the Rainbow Women. There are just so many. It, you know, Sherry, when you when you talk about things you can't explain, there are just there are so many things you can't explain. So many things that that we're, we're just covered in, in blessings with this. Uh, and um, one of the things that I have experienced since the very beginning of this is uh, I uh, I don't even know if Deb wanted me to share this, but I have seen I see rainbows a lot with this, uh, and I know that the rainbows are are signs that something something amazing is going to happen with the corn, and then it usually does within 24 hours. Something somebody comes forward and says something, or something happens. Uh, so I'm always sending Deb pictures. Look at this rainbow. Uh, it's usually double rainbows, but. I, when I was looking for some articles, I was looking for a specific article in the Palmer Journal yesterday. Couldn't find it. I never did find the article, but I found some other articles that were really amazing. There were a lot of articles written about the Pawnee in the Palmer Journal. And one of them was the, a man, they interviewed a man that had traveled across this area can't remember where he was heading somewhere else in Nebraska I think and as he was coming through there were Pawnee women working in the fields and they were hoeing and they were bent completely over to the ground as they were hoeing and they looked like rainbows all over in the field and I thought oh, uh, you know that's perfect <laughs> that uh of course, they they looked like rainbows, uh, and I I just thought that was uh, absolutely perfect. Uh, you know, just there are so many things all, over and over and over every year. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. It's just like it's almost like I would I, I would be completely against ever starting uh, trying to grow the corn here in Nebraska without it being blessed. And I actually. If I had a wish, it would be that all of the gardens in Nebraska could be blessed. Because I, because when I see the power that comes from the blessing of the seeds, I think that if the gardens were blessed, it would be even, even better. You know, and I know when Mikai was here, uh, in whatever gardens she could go to, she was trying to to do some of that. But um, I, I really believe that. The, the blessing of, of the Pawnee uh, there, that, uh, you know, it's so sacred, the corn is so sacred. And, and I believe that Atias is working through that, um, through the corn with the relationship with, with it and is protecting the corn and, uh, and is, you know, that's why all these, I think, I mean, how can we start with, two handfuls of corn and be at 16 varieties now. I mean, what makes sense about that? Uh, and when other people hear about that, well, that's taken us a long time. We're, we've been doing this for 17 years and these gardeners have been doing it. You know, they've, they've been a, an integral part of that happening. But who does that? Who starts with two varieties and winds up with 16? Uh, You know that there's more than just us doing this. It isn't just us. So there's there's ancestors in there. There's all kinds of things making this happen. I do believe. Thank you, Ronnie. Anyone else? Hey, Lance. Yeah. Uh, I would like to just share a thought. Um, I, I know we're feel that, uh, and this is just from uh, 
an experience when I had my farm in Asher, Oklahoma, and Grandma, Nora Keys, had come down to visit. And uh, my husband and I had planted a little bit of little garden in our corral. And while she was down there, I had, we had just picked some corn. And she just was really uh, kind of... Uh, uh, emotional in the sense that she said, Oh, I, I wish, I wish I had known. And it sounded like that they were very, it was very important to, uh, I'm, I'm assuming maybe pray or be thankful before they picked the first corn of the crop. Uh, that has always stuck with me with my grandma when she was down there visiting me. There was just something about uh, something special about picking the corn, the first corn of the crop. But I, I would like to say that I don't think it's important to know or that it's a, a dire thing that we need to know an explanation that, that there's something greater than us uh, at work with this corn. It's not the explanation, but it's the knowing that I feel is what is important. And that knowing, you could either call it belief or you could call it spirit. I think spirit fits it uh, very well. But, uh, you know, I don't think, I mean, we don't have to prove anything to anybody, but like Ronnie says, I'm sure she knows in her heart that there's there's something greater happening and we're blessed to be a part of it in every way, shape and form. So I think that's where our joy should be is in the knowing that um, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful because we do now have that much corn that has come back to us. So that's my thought. Well, thank you, Sherry. Uh, those are good words. Thank you for sharing that thought with us. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to rush past this part of what we're doing tonight. Uh, I want to give people time to think about what they want to say, uh, have a chance to, to share that. It's a very rich night tonight. Um, I'm uh, seeing interesting things coming full circle. Uh, one of those that I'm thinking about, and uh, Roger, if you're still on here, yeah, uh, correct me, but isn't uh, Palmer, that area, isn't that where uh, the, uh, where Echo Hawk was born? No, the Palmer site was a steady metropolitan center and our ancestor Baptiste Bale he was born there during the 1820s he and his uh, siblings and uh, so that was the Tee City the name of it translates as old town and this is a community name that reflects the ancient history of the city people and an ancient community that was located in that area as I believe that had that name at the founding of the Steedy Federation hundreds of years ago and the Skeedy founded that community there uh, probably sometime during the 18th century and lived there for many decades uh, because of this association with ancient history and so the Palmer site the Palmer location this was associated with uh, our skeety ancestors. 
Thank you. Well, that is still interesting. Uh, although, you know, we by name are the Echo Hawk family, we do look back to uh, the Ski D side of our family, and Baptiste Behal is a big figure there. And I uh, wanted to make sure Ronnie knew we have we have family connections there, and uh, and you grew up there, <laughs> and I just I thought that was was interesting. It's interesting to hear your story and see those connections and uh, know that you come from a, a family with a heritage of uh, being allies with the Pawnee. And I like to hear that. Lance, uh, Lance, I have a few comments if, if I may. Sure. Um, not, not related to the corn right now, so we'll just call it a maybe like a little commercial or something. But um, Nancy and I have um, started a project. Nebraska has a highway naming program. And we've, um, and actually uh, Walter has helped us get this through and, he, and, he, and he's uh, sent us a, a, what, a proclamation from the business council, Pawnee Business Council to uh, name the highway between Genoa and Fullerton in Nance County, the, the 22 parallels, basically the Loop River, the uh, Pawnee Scouts Memorial Highway. And we are going to find out in the next couple of weeks if um, it's selected. They only select one highway per year to uh, be named. And again, we're going to find out in a few weeks, so that's going to be kind of exciting. Um, last year, I just found out not too long ago, the they named a highway north of us up in uh, Ponca, up uh, closer in Ponca land, um, the uh, Medal of Honor Memorial Highway. And in the list of the Medal of Honors, they do have the Pawnee um, Scout and Correct me, traveling bear or mad bear, one or the other, is listed as one as 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 a uh, Medal of Honor winner on on that highway. And the last thing um, you were you were talking about the Palmer Palmer, the Palmer site, but just to the east of that, if and Lance, I know you're familiar with the uh, um, Horse Creek site, and John Russell and Ethelene Russell have owned that property forever. And John had died a year or so ago, and but sadly, Ethelene died just a few months ago, and they were really, really good hosts about letting uh, the Pawnee on their land. And, and John, and they both just, they really enjoyed um, showing off the, the, the uh, Horse Creek area. And so I don't know what's gonna happen there now, but they were, they were really good about taking care of it three little things that <laughs> had nothing to do with corn, but. <laughs> well, thank you, Jerry. Uh, I, I, I don't know if uh, everyone <clears throat> in the, the Nebraska callers know the Pawnee tribe is composed of four bands. And when Roger was talking about the Ski D, that's one of them. And yeah. we, we have ancestors there and, um, your, uh, your uh, Jerry and Nancy, your place, you've named it uh, in the Kit Kahaki, which is our, uh, that's also our, our band. And we, we look to, we, I, I think, self identify more with Kit Kahaki than Ski D, but we do both. And uh, I appreciate the acknowledgement that you, you've done with that. I, I have a question uh, about something that Deb said, and maybe uh, any of you gardeners or Ronnie could uh, address this, but there was a statement made, and I've heard it made before, that weakening the corn has something to do with helping varieties come out of that, that one variety. It is part of the process of create, creating, or in this case, recreating uh, varieties that are somehow locked up in that one that gets unlocked in the weakening. Can you say something 
someone uh, address something more about that? I can start with that one. Anybody else can add? Uh, Jerry's an agronomist himself, so he might be able to add some things to that too. But what we've discovered is that the latest varieties that the Pawnee were working with were varieties that they created from ancient varieties. They're more ancient varieties over hundreds of years. I, you know, I don't know how long it takes <laughs> to create one. Uh, we're figuring out how many years it takes to go back to one, to one of the more ancient, to the more older ones. It takes about seven. Uh, so we're, once we start working with them, so we're figuring that out. But so, so let's take eagle corn for an example. Eagle corn was brought up with the Pawnee from Central America. It used to be, we said about 12, 1250, what, we, you know, what I read was 1250 was about when the Pawnee, but Carlton Gover said he, he found villages dating back to 900 to 1100. So that's longer ago than 1200 that the Pawnee were here. So they brought with them the varieties that they had at the time. So eagle corn happens to be one that still looks like eagle corn. It hasn't become something else, but mother corn was uh, one of the more ancient ones. So when, when they had some of these more ancient ones as they got here, and I, you know, it's a long story, but I am starting to see what's going on with this corn over years and I can, and I can see how I think I know how they were doing it, but it was, it's a much longer process than going backwards. Uh, but I, and for a long time, I thought, well, they must be getting some other tribes corn and they're combining. I think there was some of that going on, but not much, uh, not, not much. I think they were doing it from their own corn and I'm starting to see what was going on there. Uh, by the reverse process, I'm starting to see what would happen going forward just from watching it every year. So they were taking those corns, maybe combining their own whatever and creating new varieties from it, improving it. When they got to Nebraska, Nebraska is corn country. So coming here, they were able to create strong varieties from what they had, uh, strengthen varieties, and I'm sure it grew well when they were in Central America also. And, and then I don't know how the travel happened on the way up here and what would have happened to it. But when you get to unique soil like Nebraska has, things are going, unique things are gonna to start to happen. Different things happen because of different soils. And anybody can comment on that if they want to. But so it was really, so we started on this in, growing in 2004 and it wasn't until 2017 that we really started to really really figure out what was going on uh, oh my goodness when i look about how much we didn't know just 10 years ago it's scary <laughs> you know but thank goodness we had pawnee corn and it was growing because it you know it just it, it loves it here so uh, and it's blessed so in 2017, Will and Hyde were uh, two scientists trying to sell corn to, uh, to ag people. And when we found their records and saw what these varieties grew like 100 years ago, and, all, and then all of a sudden it was like, oh my goodness, there was a, a yellow Pawnee flower corn. Jerry Carlson, that's those little yellow kernels that we have, we, you know, have been showing up, you know, and and Jerry actually gave me this cute little thing made out of beads with what that was white flower corn it had one little yellow kernel in there because that would happen from time to time. We couldn't, we didn't know why, couldn't explain why, but then all of a sudden reading those records, we, we knew what was going on. So all of a sudden from 2017, when we had eight varieties, it's 2020 now and we have 16 because boom, once we figured out, uh, how to take the strong varieties that the Pawnee had here and as they were weakening because we didn't have enough seeds to work with, that, you know, because you should have an eighth of an acre at least to strengthen. Uh, 
we just have not had enough seeds for years. It's taken a long time. It's been a long process. So we started to weaken in some areas. Some soil weakens the corn more than other soil. Uh, we've discovered that too. So, which has been a wonderful thing. Oklahoma weakens, uh, weakens things and, and my goodness, we can get all kinds of speckled kernels now to work with if, if it's grown in Oklahoma. So it has a purpose. And then you start growing them all together. And a great example of that is the, to me this year, the yellow uh, flower corn which is a beautiful lemon yellow and uh, no dents in it. It's just a beautiful corn. We went from, at first we only had one kernel showing up here or one showing up there, maybe some years none showing up because Jerry's soil is so good and so is Jerry as a gardener. Nothing, we, you know, he was getting pure white like he was, uh, you know, he was strengthening that very, very well. But then some years it would get, it would get damaged, whatever. Bug damage causes some of the kernels around it to do things. It took... The first time we planted speckled, the first time blue corn was grown in a field, it took seven years worth of seeds to plant three acres. It took us seven years to get enough seeds to plant seven acres, a five gallon bucket of corn, seven years. From that, the corn turned out, some of it turned out really beautiful, but also there were some speckled ones in there from time to time. And they pulled those out of there and we had enough to fill two thirds of a pint jar with speckled kernels. Those were all planted together the next year and that's the process we're using them. Whatever we're able to start pulling out of things, we're able to plant together. And this is the first year then we've had full ears by pulling out yellow kernels over four or five of the last years before that, we've had solid ears of nothing but yellow kernels. The whole ear is yellow kernels. We've never had that before. Uh, and we did it a matter in a matter of only four years this time because we're getting smart, you know, the corn's teaching us what to do uh, just by watching the corn and paying attention to what it's doing. It, it's, it's our best teacher. Uh, so it's, it's just incredible. It's just amazing. Uh, and because the Pawnee didn't mix their corn with other tribes, I think they did with the Arikara some in the Wichita probably, and, and we and some DNA is probably going to tell us that. But other than that, they weren't, they, you know, they weren't really doing that. So the neat thing to see is out of the records in Will and Hyde of all of the varieties of corn they were they had gotten a hold of. Somebody got gave us that didn't exist anymore, but they had grown maybe eight varieties of pony corn back in 1914 and 1915. And those were documented and we had some of them, but as we weakened those, everything, and, and, and Jean Weltfish's book, she documents all of the different varieties of corn that the Pawnee had. Everything that we see coming out of this corn that's more ancient than what they had created while they were here in Nebraska, matched what was written in the Weltfish book, Weltfish's book, or what was written in Will and Hyde. There's no other tribe's corn coming out of this. It's all Pawnee, which really says, it proves what the Pawnee have always said all along. We didn't trade our corn. We, you know, we didn't mix anybody else's corn with ours. It's been ours and ours alone and we've kept it. And that's the only corn coming out of this. There's nothing else coming out of it, but Pawnee varieties that have all been documented. It's really cool to see. Wow, well, thank you. Well, we're gonna run up on uh, two hours here in just a little bit. I don't wanna cut anyone off or rush, rush to a close here. Um, we haven't heard from uh, others that I'm sure have something to add, if you'd like. Elaine, I would like to uh, thank Ronnie. I met you uh, in Nebraska when Sherry invited me to come last year. And I just want to say that uh, I'm of Scotch-Irish descent and since I've known Sherry, I have come to realize the shameful way the Europeans have treated uh, our Native American people. 
and uh, it is just shameful, and I'm ashamed. Uh, but what was very profound about your story is that through all those generations, the importance of what a family teaches in attitude. So that 150 something years ago when Edmund came, they had a positive relationship with uh, the, the Pawnee people that as human beings, things could have been different, should have been different. And I took notes through your story. It is just simply profound what she said. And I, I feel very emotional listening to it. And I just want to thank you. And uh, the, um, I hope a lot of people can hear this story and realize the rights that need to be, the wrongs that need to be righted. And to know that you said, were they Mormons? And if so, was that part of the reason they may have had a different attitude than maybe a lot of the other religious people who, who didn't show the respect. And thank right. you so much. Oh, thank you. That's, that's sweet of you. The, the O'Briens were and still are Irish Catholic, uh, but the Mormon trail was coming through. So they were interacting with the Mormons, which made them pretty much outcast among the other settlers also because you know, the, there was a stigma among the, the Mormons, just like there were with, uh, there was the fear of any Indian. And I'm sorry, but that's the word. Uh, anything you read, that's, that, that's what, what everybody would say. So, um, but Edmund, he wasn't, he wasn't afraid. Uh, Ellen was at first. Um, he, he wasn't afraid of that at all. Um, and I think his background, you know, he fled for his life too, leaving Ireland. And I, th I just think that you know, but there's, there's definite commitment. Uh, you know, once you decided you were going one way, uh, you know, there was no going back in it was as far as everyone else was concerned. So, I mean, you had to make that. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you again. Well, there, there's something you said, Nancy, that I'd like to come back to, but before I um, uh, want to give everyone a chance. Elaine? Yeah. Nancy, Nancy didn't mention, but her grandma was uh, uh, full blood Irish, besides the other stuff. <laughs> we did have an awesome uh, experience going up to Nebraska and picking the blue corn last year. And uh, um, it was just an uh, awesome experience. I, I don't know. If we'll ever have another one like that, but I sure hope that the blue corn keeps growing. <laughs> Did you have something, hello? Yeah, um, this has been awesome. I don't know how many times I will be able to say it. Um, I'm so thankful that, that, that this was put on. I'm so, I'm so thankful. <laughs> um, and now when I talk about the Pawnee Seed Preservation Project, I will be able to, you know, give more detail. I will be able to, you know, talk, just talk even more about it. Um, when I was in Massachusetts, I brought um, some uh, corn and people were like, oh my gosh, I've been trying to get this. I've been like, cause I, you know, you, I, I gave it, I brought it for, for giveaway and People were so happy. They were like, I've been reading about this. I follow it on Facebook. I, you know, and they were just like so shocked. And I was like, well, you know, now you can try what you've been reading about and hopefully, you know, support the seed project even more, you know? And it, it's, I, mean, I just, I don't even have any more words. This has been so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Hillel. I follow you too. <laughs> Just want you to know that. Thanks. I yeah, I love getting your little your little comments and everything. Uh, Ronnie, I wonder if you wouldn't mind uh, 
sharing a little bit about the uh, your Pawnee name and how that came came to be. Oh boy, I'm starting to blush. I, I, I just really get so emotional when when uh, I can still hardly believe it. Actually, um, uh, well, I, I you know I don't know. I was surprised, so I really don't know how it came about, but. Um, but that it's funny because I guess it shouldn't be surprised at this point about anything, but, um, you know, I grew up on a corn farm and really didn't plan on growing corn ever again. I was tired of it and tired of carrying irrigation pipes and it was work and we had no attachment to it, except that we were all excited at the end of the year when the harvest came in because we were going to have money. Money was the main focus of corn. Uh, so Deb talks about that all the time that she feels sorry for the farmers because they just don't have. And I think any of us that have grown up on a farm, we do understand, we can see that this is different. It is a different, it's a relationship with corn, what we do. And I can tell you that when I grew up on the farm, I felt I had a relationship with corn. Um, because I was in it every day and muddy every day from being in corn, sometimes in the middle of the night uh, in, in a drought year. I spent a lot of time with corn and I thought I understood what corn was, but I saw it as a, a crop. I saw it as a means to our income and our family needed it. And we worked very hard alongside our dad all summer long to and, and into the harvest to make sure that we were going to have it. But the, but, uh, and, and Deb makes a very good point that when we can't eat the corn that we grow, that really does cause a disconnect. And uh, yes, I think there's this, the relationship is still there. And if I were to ask any farmer today, if they feel strongly about a relationship with the land and growing and, and, and their corn, they would say, oh, absolutely. And I agree that they do, but the, the level of relationship doesn't compare. And for me to go from someone who didn't even want to look at corn again, because I was tired of my, you know, my face was getting sliced every summer. We were carrying irrigation, but my arms were getting sliced. Uh, and it was hard work. And all of our, our friends were swimming and stuff. And there we were out in cornfields and We'd go and detassel corn, which happens in Nebraska, and, and we'd get off at noon. We'd go at five in the morning, get off at noon, and we'd be absolutely exhausted, and everybody would go home, and we'd go home and irrigate. I was tired of corn. Um, and my name in the tribe, Adati Natis Kitty Potsky, means little corn sister. You could have never told me that I would ever have the name Little Corn Sister when I left the farm. I never grew corn again, not even sweet corn, until I started growing for Deb. Uh, and what a changed person I am because of someone who has really had the opportunity to have a relationship with corn and with Pawnee, with Pawnee corn and with the Pawnee tribe, with Pawnee people. Uh, I have grown immensely because, and I know the other gardeners would say the same thing. I mean, you can't be a part of this and not just, and, 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 be involved with the Pawnee culture. Uh, and a lot of the gardeners have been down to Pawnee. Uh, I think most of the people that are on the phone right now, have, if not all of them have been down to Pawnee. Uh, yeah, I think everybody has been down there. Uh, so, you know, and when, when we had the, the, the night that Amy was on and Deb was on, and Deb talked about how she feels when she comes to Nebraska and what that means to her. And then Amy said, you know, I think it's important that we focus also on import, how important Pawnee, Oklahoma is to people. I get that same feeling when I go to Pawnee that Deb gets when she comes here. 
and I just think it's uh, these two. It's it's a part. It's it's a relationship between those two places, Nebraska and and Pawnee, and I'm sure the gardeners would say the same thing, or they or they might say the same thing. Um, but I. I guess I never even, I, I, I know, I never even gave it one thought, not a single thought that I would ever have a Pawnee name. Uh, because that's not why I do what I do. I do what I do because it's the right thing to do. Uh, and it's important. Uh, it's not only important to the Pawnee, this, what we are doing is important to Nebraska because I think Nebraska needs healing through this uh, because all of us who know the history of what happened here and our descendants of people that settled in Nebraska have to feel the same way when we, when we hear about it about what happened. I didn't hear about it for so long and I wonder how many people, other people have it. And you know, there's a responsibility there too. We, we need to educate people. But I, I just think that uh, there's a lot of, I feel I've had a lot of healing through it. Um, and hopefully there will be other people in Nebraska and, and other people, you know, hopefully in the Pawnee. Um, that will also, and hopefully that relationship's going to get stronger. And uh, I just, I think the name, uh, the, the fact that I, that I was given a name, I, I just still can't even believe, uh, you know, because there, there've been so many people a part of this. I've only been a part of everything. Uh, so it's, uh, I don't know. I'm still pretty speechless about it. Don't know what to say because uh, it's hard to feel that you can deserve something like that, you know, because I know those that is not done lightly within the Pawnee Nation. And uh, I don't know. Um, so I feel very responsible for living up to that. Uh, name. Um, we still have a lot to do. And uh, but I'm, I'm just a part, I'm just a piece of it. And you take away all the other gardeners, and we, and we wouldn't have accomplished hardly anything at all by now, because it takes a lot. A lot. So if I was the, just think, if, uh, and I think about this all the time, if I was the only one that was ever working with Pawnee corn, we, I'd be where we were like 13 years ago, because how many varieties do we put in the ground every year? Uh, 10? I, I don't have room. Um, you know, uh, we're a force. We, we are a, a, we're a force as a group. And more than uh, that, our group is very knowledgeable about gardening, which is wonderful. I, I, you know, talk about other blessings, the people that have come forward and wanted to garden for us and help us and, and work with us. Really, they understand gardening. We're pretty picky, but you know what? We don't have to be super picky because the people that come forward are the right people uh, and, and help us grow and help us learn and uh, I know I've called Jerry with questions and I've called Bill with questions, you know, and uh, different people. So we lean on each other. It, it's a, it's a, it's a group. And it's weird because it's almost like watching bread rice. How did I go back to that? Um, you know, looking out the corn, at, at your window and watching corn grow is a pretty slow process. And it's kind of a lonely process sometimes. Um, I can't tell you what it means when the Pawnee come up here. I think for all of us, even if Kahita is the only one that comes up and she's coming up to document the gardens, for every gardener, when a Pawnee comes and visits your garden, that, that's just really cool uh, because that's, this, that's what we're doing this for. You know, uh, so I guess 
I'm speechless, but I have a lot to say about what it means <laughs> uh, to be speechless. But um, thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I, I want to start working on wrapping things up, but that doesn't mean if you still have something you want to jump in to say, please do that. Uh, there's, there's a couple of threads I'd like to see if I can tie together here. Um, <clears throat> I'm a retired uh, mental health and substance abuse counselor. And one of the things I've looked at in, uh, in my active career was historical trauma. And I know that the story that we're talking about and alluding to is that kind of a story. So I want to point out that uh, there's two sides to pretty much every coin. And on one side is the trauma. And on the other side is the resilience. And they both need to be taken together. And I was interested in hearing about the, uh, the corn. Uh, so when I try to talk about these things, I get, I get pretty emotional. But the corn uh, going down to Oklahoma. And uh, being weakened there. But out of that weakening uh, comes a, uh, a return to an old diversity and a, a thriving and a potential for, for thriving again. And I want to acknowledge that and, and point out a lot of Pawnee people uh, think of animals and plants as, as relatives. Uh, buffalo uh, are our relatives and the corn is a relative. And there's some kind of lesson being taught here uh, about uh, suffering and, and about uh, weakening and then about thriving. It's, it's like the, the corn relatives are telling us something that can happen not just to them, but to us, their relatives. So there's a story here. If I had to, if I had to point to say, what does reconciliation and, and uh, healing look like in a boots on the ground, practical kind of application way? I would have to say, I can't find a clearer uh, example than this. Uh, Ronnie's, your legacy of coming from a family of allies and your, your work today of, and Deb's work, your joint work of uh, creating a network of allies in our very homeland. Um, well, as you can tell, I deeply uh, feel that. I, uh, I want to say that when you touch on the, the topics of a, a painful, unjust, brutal history, and then there it is. And what do you do? What do you do next? In the recovery world, we talk about doing the next right thing. And that's where uh, recovery begins. That's where healing begins. And being able to hear the story and take those next right steps is where reconciliation begins. 
And I just want to address the uh, ne Nebraska people here and, and say, in, in my estimation, you are allies and you're working in a bigger picture than maybe you know. Maybe you have thought about it and, and maybe you haven't, but I wanted to uh, acknowledge that in the, the clearest way that I could. So uh, that's my thanks to you, Ronnie, uh, doing what you've done, sharing what you've shared, and uh, everyone that has shown up to participate in hearing you out. Uh, there's there's a, a very beautiful story. You, writing a different end to a tragic story is always beautiful. So thank you, thank you all. So any last uh, takers before we uh, wrap up? Well, I appreciate everyone uh, <clears throat> taking the time. My timer says uh, two hours and 16 minutes. So I appreciate the investment that you've, you've all made. And uh, I, I guess we'll keep it at that. Unless Ronnie or Deb, you have one last thing you wanna share with us. Thank you, sir, for your kind emotion. Uh, it's not always that you see uh, a family member, a male, show such emotion, and and I uh, I appreciate that. It means a lot. You know, I described many many years of, of what I was doing as uh, working like the little red hen. You know, I'm just doing things on my own. And uh, um, it's always wonderful to, to, to get that kind of a, a response from someone that I always look up to. Um, BC had mentioned uh, uh, the passing of elders recently. And uh, one of them is uh, Francis Morse. Um, who served many years as a, a chief. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he was a tough chief to work with. You know, he was uh, one of the chiefs, well, he was the uh, eldest chief on the council. And so the other chiefs always looked up to him. And uh, um, he, uh, didn't always agree with what I was wanting to do. Um, and uh, it wasn't too long ago, but uh, a year, year ago, maybe, um, I uh, went to go see him. Uh, he, he was staying at the same place my mom was, is at now. And, uh, um, he, he told me, he said, uh, you know, he got emotional too. And he, he said, uh, that, uh, he told me that, you know, that, that he didn't always agree with what I was doing. Um, he felt like, uh, when we moved to Oklahoma, that, that we had, uh, lost traditions uh, that we should never try to do again. We put bundles in museums and we don't open them up and use them because we don't know how. We don't have that, that teaching with it. Uh, and he felt like the corn was in the same category that that was a thing we did in Nebraska and we no longer have it. But here comes Deb, and she doesn't go away. She kept coming to all the meetings, and you know, you just kept coming back. He said, "You're coming back," and 
and explaining what was going on and how the corn wanted to live again. And um, he apologized to me with tears and said, I'm so sorry I gave you such a hard time. And I see what you're doing and it's good. I just had to tell you that, you know, so uh, it's always uh, those, those kind of things are always heartfelt. Um, you know, our, I know our, our chiefs have pondered adopting uh, uh, Ronnie for years and uh, it was finally our kick of hockey chiefs that said, Deb, just do it. We don't have to be involved in it and just, just go ahead and adopt her. And um, so uh, Donna Hare helped me out with that and, and we picked a good time to do it and surprised Ronnie with the, that name. And um, anyway, it's like you said, it's a good story and we have a lot to look forward to. But thank you everybody for all your kind words and thoughts. Love you all. Well, thank you, Deb. Uh, thank you, BC, for and Lucille for sharing what you shared and uh, and uh, including us in your in your grief. That's always an honor, and I, I want to acknowledge that before we all get gone. But uh, our thoughts, our prayers are with uh, those of us and and you too, in particular. Uh, when it comes to, to grief and uh, we want to honor that. So, but thank you everyone for uh, being here tonight. It was a good night. Thank you. <laughs>